So there is a warning this morning that a shortage of care workers in England is contributing to a significant increase in the number of elderly and disabled people waiting for support. Latest figures suggest more than half a million vulnerable patients are facing delayed assessments, reviews or home visits. Our social affairs editor, Alison Holt, explains. Hello, are you all right? This is one of the four care visits a day that Ralph and Pat rely on. You had a nice morning, Ralph. He has Parkinson's and they wouldn't cope in their own home near Redcar without this support. You rely on your carers to look after him properly, don't you? You know, so, I mean, it's something I couldn't do. I can't handle him at all. Well, it took me all my time to look after myself now. Just the two tablets this afternoon, Ralph, all right. But today's research by council yeah. bosses says an increasing number of people who are older or disabled are having to wait for care services like this. There you go. One reason is the shortage of care staff. Right, we'll pop your chair up a bit. Both Sadie and Karen love what they do, but understand why, with the cost of living rising, up we go. some don't want to do a job that in their case pays less than £10 an hour. That's it, a little bit more, Ralph. Mostly it's to do with pay. People with families are trying to get on the housing ladder with the cost of living. They just can't afford to um, be in a job like this because it doesn't pay enough for them to be able to live as well. I think care workers should be paid more for doing because we don't just go in and make cups of teas of what people think we do. We actually go in and we turn people's lives around. According to the directors who run council care services in England, last September an estimated 294,000 people were waiting for assessment, reviews or care from local authorities. By the end of February this year, that number had risen to more than 500,000. Care leaders say councils need extra money urgently to meet growing demand and pay those providing care more. We need urgent action to address unmet need. We need more money into social care sooner. We can't afford for social care to be an afterthought uh, and uh, because that just creates this vicious cycle where people deteriorate and need more help, uh, more uh, health and care. And it's family carers like Tanya who feel the strain when it's hard to get help. Lee is 37, he's quadriplegic and he has multiple and complex disabilities. Lee requires 24-hour care, really, and so that's provided, majority of it is provided by me and his dad, Brian, and then we have paid carers. One of their care workers left in January because she needed to earn more money. Tanya manages Lee's care, which is NHS funded, and she's had just four applications for the job. None were suitable. Are you going to talk to me, Lee? Oh, yeah? It makes it really difficult because I have my own health needs which makes physically caring for Lee difficult because it causes me a lot of pain. My husband's self-employed because he needs to be accessible and available if I need to call him to come and help with Lee. One step. But at the end of the day he's our son so, you know, we'll do what Lee needs. under there. Tanya has little confidence they will find the help they need any time soon. The government says reforming the care system is a priority and that it's investing billions of pounds in improving the way it works for families and staff. Alison Holt, BBC News. Well, let's speak to Michelle Jackson, who's the manager of Caremark. Uh, very good morning, morning. to you, Michelle. Morning. And also with us, uh, Sarah McClinton, who's from the Association of Directors of Adult Services, who's in London. So uh, you're both very welcome morning. this morning. Now, it's very moving seeing um, the, the situation people are in, the lengths people are going to help them. Yeah. But Michelle, I, I want to ask you very straightforward questions about the services you run. Someone comes to you today, mm -hmm. you take a phone call for someone who needs, who's maybe qualified to yeah. get care at home. Uh, what, what can you do? How do what happens next? Um, that all depends on uh, what carers we've got, where the customer lives, uh, what care package they actually require, and if it fits geographically within our current rotor system. Um, past COVID, or pre-COVID, should I say, uh, we used to be able to take on 80% of, of that work, so we used to be able to help 80% of our lovely customers that obviously we take on. Unfortunately, that's flipped around now, so we have to decline 80% of the work. Is so, that... uh, let's be clear about this. So that means that the vast majority of people who need help that you would in other circumstance, you'd want to and try to give help yeah. to, you simply cannot. No. 
Is that because more people are asking for help or because the resources you have are depleted? Um, I think it's a mixture of both, to be honest. There's more and more people that are wanting to remain in their own home now and should be able to remain in their own home rather than be stuck in hospital or have to go into a care home. Um, in regards to the staff situation, there's less and less people, because of COVID, I think, coming into the care industry simply because of the poor wages that home care staff get. Um, they don't get paid shift work, so they only get paid for the actual contact care um, that they're actually delivering to our customers and the travel time and mileage. Um, and it's our staff in Redcar and Cleveland get paid national living wage which is £9.50 an hour um, and to have such a responsible job for such poor wages is not worth it when they can go and work in a pub for in excess of £10 an hour and be responsible for pints. If you put an advertisement out for a job or through the job centre or through a recruiter, recruitment agency, how much response do you get? Um, we do get quite a bit of response, but it's not the right applicants, unfortunately, at the moment. It's not the right calibre of staff, or um, they might live out of area. Um, they might not um, be in the same geographical area as that we need carers. Um, or they might actually just not want a job and are doing it for the sake of the benefit system, unfortunately. Sarah, just pick up some of the things Michelle's outlined very, very, very straightforwardly. It's just kind of maths in a way, isn't it? What about solutions? I mean, how, how, how can something change? Well, I think we've heard about the uh, highly skilled work that care workers do uh, and that pay is one of the issues. So as social care leaders, we've called for a minimum care wage. Uh, but I think it's important that we value our social care professionals in the same way that we value people working in the NHS. So we're not just um, looking at competition from retail and hospitality, but we're also uh, looking uh, uh, people in the NHS are on uh, terms and conditions, um, which are also much better, so much more secure employment. Um, so I think this, one of the solutions is that we need, a, a, clearly we need a workforce plan, so we need to plan for the future and the types of roles that we need. But I think we also need uh, action now uh, to uh, address those issues around pay. Uh, over half of home care staff are on zero hours contracts, so we also need to look at how we uh, value people and think about uh, a different way of making sure that people are properly compensated. So and Michelle was talking about the, the you said, is it 9.50, the, the living wage? So yes. Sarah, you talked about a minimum care wage. I mean, what are the figures? What, what is it you think uh, could attract people to do, as you say, what is a highly skilled, if not one that's given the respect it deserves? What are the figures? Well, so if we look at band three NHS, so that's uh, healthcare assistants who are often doing very similar work uh, to care staff, you've heard about um, how um, uh, skilled and complex some of that work is. So people uh, working with people with dementia or uh, very disabled people. So we would say that, that uh, about £11.50, which is the equivalent of what someone doing similar work in the NHS would get, uh, would be uh, about the right place to start. £11.50, does that I work? I think £11.50 is good. However, the healthcare assistants in the NHS um, are being paid shift work. So they're being paid for a 12-hour shift and they have no responsibility over medication. And my staff do. So I'd, I'd push for more. Sarah? Well, as I said, I mean, I think that that's uh, the, the place to start. But, but absolutely recognising that it's not just about pay. It's also uh, about being able to create a stable workforce. So uh, paying people for... Uh, a set number of hours uh, rather than on, on zero hours contracts. Sarah, do you think care workers are valued? I think care workers are not valued as much as they uh, need to be. Uh, I think it's really vital uh, work and, uh, you know, there are people behind all of these numbers. So, um, and I, I think in your piece we've seen how uh, not getting that vital care and support has a huge impact on our elderly relatives, on mm. disabled people, but also on carers who are having to take time off work. So there's a sort of vicious cycle. And if we don't uh, support people in their own homes, then what we find is there's a risk that people deteriorate and then they're likely in the longer term to need more social care, more health services. And we're in this vicious cycle. So we really um, do need to look at the whole system. Sarah, thank you. And Michelle, just a last thought from you. I mean, it's, it's, part, it's obviously part of this equa equation, the welfare of your staff, you yeah. know, their, their mental health, yeah. their wages. Yeah. I mean, that in itself is an issue, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, we've recently employed a life coach to help some of our staff. 
um, and that's working very, very well. And the stuff that our staff go through and what they see on a day-to-day -day basis, um, because they're going into customers' homes and dealing with maybe uh, messy terms and conditions in there, or they're dealing with people on the floor or people that have passed away, that's a big responsibility. And they're lone workers as well, so they're not in a, in a team. They are in there on their own and have the support of our wonderful supervisors. Um, but, yeah, our, our life coach that we're paying for is, is working wonders as well. Uh, Michelle, really interesting hearing your insights. Thank you so much. And Sarah McClinton, thank you for your time as well this morning. We, of course, will keep an eye on the story and we will talk about it more.